<laughs> you and Lil have a fight, I asked when I walked in and saw him by himself. She's never around anyway, so what difference is it? She runs here, she runs there. When she was sick, I took care of her. I waited on her hand and foot. The hell with her, let her go, I'm fine. I don't need anyone. It's not my business to put in, I said, but is this really a good time to start an argument? I don't argue with anybody. I never argue. If I tell her something, I like tell it to her for her own good. She doesn't want to listen, hell. <laughs> Look, put on a sweater and put on your walking shoes, and I'm going to phone Lil, and if she wants to come along, we're all going out for a walk. It's a beautiful day, and you can't sit around inside like this. I'm fine inside. I then spoke four words to him, four words that I never uttered to him before in my life. Do as I say, I told him. Put on a sweater and your walking shoes. And they were those four words. I am 55, he is almost 87, and the year is 1988. Do as I say, I tell him, and he does it. The end of one era, the dawn of another. While he went to the closet and put on a bright red sweater and his white Adidas, I phoned Lil and asked if she'd like to take a walk with us. Your father's going for a walk, she said. <laughs> really? <laughs> he, he is, come. I suggest we go out for a walk that it'll do him good and he jumps on my throat. I don't mean to criticize, but that's the truth, Philip. You're the only one he listens to. I laughed, and that may not last too long either. I'll be right down, she said. The three of us walked together to the drugstore drug three blocks away, past the old apartment buildings and the new condominiums that were going up where the last of Elizabeth's opulent Victorian houses had once stood. Lil held him by one arm and I by the other, since walking had become very uncertain for him because of his poor vision. Only a few months earlier, he had been patiently waiting for the cataract on his good eye to ripen so that it could be removed. Now, instead of looking forward to the minor surgery that would restore his vision, and with it, he confidently assumed his robust independence, he was contemplating an operation on his head that could kill him. As we walked, he began to reminisce in a very rambling way. My memory is no good anymore, he explained. But that wasn't exactly true. The sequence was often random and the focus sometimes blurry. But then the larger logic of his recollections could always be a little elusive, even in the best of times. He certainly had no difficulty remembering the names of people dead now 20, 30, and 40 years, or where they had lived, to whom they were related, and what they had said to him or he to them on occasions not necessarily that remarkable. Through my father's mother's line, we belonged to a vast family network that had eventually organized into a family association in 1939, at the outbreak of the European War. While I was growing up, the association had consisted of some 80 families in and around Newark and some 70 in and around Boston. There was an annual convention and an annual summer outing, a family newspaper that was printed quarterly, a family song, a family seal, and family stationery. A current roster of names and addresses of every family member was sent out to everyone each year. A happy day fund looked after the ill and the convalescing, and an education fund assisted the children of the family with their college tuition. In 1943, Herman Roth had become the fifth family member and the second of his brothers to be elected president. His first vice president had been Harold Chabin of Roxbury, Massachusetts. <clears throat> Harold Chabin was the son of Max Chabin and Ida Flasher. Harold's uncle was Uncle Sam Flashner, a family pioneer in America. His second vice president was Herman Goldstein, who lived in New York. Goldstein was a hatter, loved to play cards with Leibowitz, had married Celia. All this was recounted to Lil and me as we began our walk down North Street. Our family association, he said, back in those years, was one of the largest and strongest associations of its kind in the United States. It was the very time in which he used to tell me as a boy that Metropolitan Life, his employer, was, quote, the largest financial institution in the world. We may have been ordinary people, but our affiliations were not without grandeur. <laughs> Out of nowhere, he said, 
When my father sold the house on Rector Street, he sold it to an Italian family. Did he? How much did he get? What year was that? I was born in 1901 and moved to Rutgers Street in 1902. We lived there 14 years, so it must have been sold in 1916. $6,000, that's what he got for it. The Italian paid him in nickels, dimes, and quarters. It took a week to count it. <laughs> <laughs> Only a week? <laughs> my father, he said, as we approached the drugstore to which my mother had taken the last long walk of her life eight years earlier. My father had to beat my older brother Ed to prevent him from marrying a worldly woman. Had to beat him. My uncle Ed had been a bruiser with a short fuse. He used to take me to football games when I was a child. His big hands and his broken nose and his rough, argumentative nature would thrill me for an hour or two, and I loved him. But I was always glad at the end of the day's outing that he was my cousin Florence. He never told me that, I said. Grandpa beat him? Had to. Save him. Save him from that woman. How old was that then? 23. <laughs> he first told me that story when I was 16 and in my last year of high school. I don't remember why he told it, but it was at dinner near the end of the meal, and I had jumped up from the table in a rage and then bolted from the room when I'd heard him conclude we don't have that kind of discipline anymore. <laughs> my mother had come into my bedroom to try to get me to go back to eat my dessert. She had begged me to forgive him for whatever he had said that had offended me. So, please, dear, do it for me. But I had been adamant and refused to return to spoon down jello across the table from somebody who considered beating the love for a woman out of a 23-year-old man, even one as pig-headed as my Uncle Ed, a praiseworthy form of discipline. <laughs> no doubt he had forgotten that incident, and so actually had I, until the moment, 39 years later, when for some obscure reason he had chosen to tell the story to me again. But there was no rage now against the storyteller. It was I, in fact, who now said to him philosophically, well, you don't have that kind of discipline. <laughs> <laughs> we were walking back now the way we've come. He was silent for a while. When, as though having glimpsed the solution to some intractable problem, after a long and arduous effort, he began to say, Yes. Yeah. Guess what? I asked. I've been alive a long time. You're the insurance man, you know the statistics, on the actuarial charts, you have achieved a great age. Where is the tumor? He asked for the second time in two days. In front of the brain stem, at the base of the skull. Have you seen the pictures? I didn't want him to think that too much had been going on without his knowledge, and so I lied. I couldn't read him if I had it. Look, it's operable, remember that. But that was what he couldn't forget and dreaded most. If we all decide that's the course to follow, then he'll go in and get it out, and after a brief convalescence, you'll be yourself again. It would be nice to have a few more years, he said. You'll get them, I said. I drove over again on Sunday morning, and he had a set of sherry glasses ready for me to take away. Each glass individually wrapped in a page, in a page of the previous week's Sunday Star Ledger, and all of them wedged bulkily together in a shoebox. He never used them, he said, he didn't need them, and he wanted me to enjoy them in the country. Ever since my mother's death, each time he came to stay with me in Connecticut, he had something with him, in a paper bag, or a shopping bag, or in the little plaid valise that he carried alongside him during the three-hour car ride with the local driver I sat down to Elizabeth again. Unlike the sherry glasses, it was usually a present for him and my mother from me, but now, years later, he was returning, <laughs> as though what they had been given had only been on loan <laughs> or left there in the store. Here are those napkins. Here are the placemats. Here are the steak knife. Here are the flower pots. Here are the coffee pots. Because in the beginning, when I resisted explaining to him that they're yours, they were gifts, 
He would reply with no idea that there was, might be a grain of insult working in his <laughs> unburdening. What the hell do I need him for? <laughs> Look at this clock. A beautiful clock that somebody gave. Must have cost a fortune. What good is it to me? The clock had cost about $200 in Hungary in 1973. I had given it to my mother, a little porcelain clock with a floral design of the kind she liked, and I bought for her in an antique shop in Budapest on my way home one spring from visiting friends in Prague. But I took it back silently. Little by little, I took everything back, <laughs> struck each time by how inconsequential, inconsequential to him was the sentimental value, even the material value, of things intended to betoken the love of those he most cherished. Strange, I would think, to find that particular blank spot in a man on whom the claims of family were so emotionally tyrannical. Or maybe not strange at all. How could mere keepsakes encapsulate for him the overpowering force of blood bond? Item by item, I took it all back like a well-trained refund clerk in a birthday <laughs> to Barnes. But wondering if perhaps what he was thinking while he wrapped these gifts in old newspaper and stuffed them in cartons of every description was that this way we wouldn't have too many of his possessions to bother about after his funeral. He could be a pitiless realist, but I wasn't his offspring for nothing and I could be realistic too. This time, instead of silently accepting the goods being returned, I reminded him that I was still a transient in a New York hotel, didn't know when I'd next be home in Connecticut, and would just as soon have him hold on to the glass. <laughs> Take them, he insisted. I want to get rid of them. <laughs> Dad, I said, setting his shoebox on the brake front, where I assumed the glasses had been stored all these years, these glasses are the least but rushing around the apartment, looking for the next thing to get rid of, finding the glasses, packing them in the newspaper, finding the shoebox, for a moment this had given the day a purpose, provided some little release for all that was brutally for Now there was nothing for him but to be frightened again. I was sorry, suddenly, for not having let him have his way and just <coughs> taking the damn things back to the hotel. But I was getting frazzled, too. I've been like that all my life, he said, dropping unhappily onto this spot on the sofa. Like what? Impulsive. I was unused to hearing this kind of self-criticism from him, and I wondered if it was such a wonderful development. At the age of 86, with a massive tumor in his head, better to continue wearing at either side of his bridle those blinders that had kept him pulling his load straight ahead all his life. I wouldn't worry about it, I said. It isn't as if you're only impulsive. You can be cautious and food. So you oscillate. People do. But he was being gnawed at by something and wouldn't be consoled. What do you think? I gave my filling away. I got rid of my filling. Why? They were sitting in the drawer. Fill in are the two small leather boxes containing brief biblical extracts that an Orthodox Jew fastens to himself by narrow thumbs during his weekday morning prayer. One box strapped to the forehead, the other to the left arm. Back when my father was an overworked insurance man, being a Jew for him hadn't had much to do with formal worship, and like most of the first generation American fathers in our neighborhood, he visited the nearby synagogue only on the high holidays and when it was necessary as a man. Since his retirement, however, and particularly in the last decade of my mother's life, they had begun to attend services together mostly every Friday night. And though he still didn't go so far as to put on Tillin in the morning, his Judaism was more pointedly focused on the synagogue and the service and the, and the rabbi than it had been at any time since his childhood. The temple was a hundred or so yards down the road on a little side street off the North Broad in an old house that was rented by the small congregation of elderly local people who were barely able to meet the upkeep costs. The yeshiva student came over from New York to lead their services on the weekend. A 23-year-old, whom my father called Rabbi, most respectful, 
and Swilgrove is something of a sage. However humble their manifestations, these yearnings for a formalized religion in his old age were inspired by something far from hypocrisy and conventional decor. In fact, the consolation that he seemed to derive from going to synagogue regularly, the sense of unity it bestowed on his long life, and the communion with his, with, with his own mother and father, he told me he felt there, made his getting rid, as he put it, of the tefillin, one of the more enigmatic instances of his lifelong habit of relinquishing, rather than saving, the treasured objects of the past. Given the link of sentiment that Jewish belief now seemed to furnish between the isolation of old age and the striving populist life that was already gone, I could have imagined him, instead of parting with his tefillin, rediscovering in the mere contemplation of them something of their ancient fetishistic power. 